Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome back to the show the one and only Dr. Jeff Kripal. Dr. Kripal holds the J. Newton Razor Chair in Philosophy and Religious Thought at Rice University and is the Associate Director of the Center for Theory and Research at Esalen. He joins us today to talk about his latest book, The Flip. Quick note before we begin, there were some complications getting through to Dr. Kripal's office line from Skype, so I called his cell phone instead. For the most part, it's completely clear, but there are a few dropouts because, you know, cell phones. Nothing too distracting, though. Let's do it. The prolific Dr. Jeff, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> oh, well, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I love our chats and, uh, and your latest book was, uh, yes, a real page turner. So I guess we should probably start with the obvious question. Uh, what's the flip? Um, so the flip is my expression for trained intellectuals, primarily scientists and philosophers and medical professionals who are committed materialists until they have some extraordinary experience and they flip. They they realize that the world isn't all matter, that mind or consciousness is somehow as fundamental as the material dimension. But they also realize that their science or technology or medicine work just as well in this new worldview, that their earlier materialism was just an interpretation that it's not necessary to the science or the medicine. So that's the flip. And uh, I mean, that's certainly the the content of the book. And I mean, I've read all your other stuff as well, uh, Dr. Kripal. And so it sort of begs the question, uh, who's the book for? Is it for people who are pre-flip or post-flip? Or is it um, for a wider <laughs> audience? <laughs> Well, okay. So, yeah, the book has a backstory, like all books. Um, it started out as a kind of manifesto I wrote in 2014 in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is sort of the New York Times of the academic world. It's it's what administrators and deans and provosts read, and it was really an essay trying to argue that we'll never understand the world unless we can somehow integrate what the humanities have to say with what the scientists have to say, that there's an inside to the world and an outside to the world. So that little seed essay then attracted the attention of this press called Bellevue Literary Press, which was founded by a medical doctor in a hospital in New York for the express intention of bringing the humanities and the sciences into conversation. And the, the editor there contacted me, and she had read the piece, really liked it, and asked me if I would expand it into a book. So that's a long-winded way of saying that I suppose um, initially the book was aimed at people in the sciences and people in the humanities who were having trouble having a conversation across that that fence or that abyss um, and to try to get us talking. Having said that, I, I hope it's broader than that. I mean, it's, I tried to write it in a way that's possible to people who certainly weren't scientists, that, like I'm not, but also who weren't humanists, that, you know, that had, these, had these interests that were, I would say, just simply human. Uh, they want to know what reality is. 
Well, I, I do believe it is broader than that. My next question is, is this the best Kripal book for people to start on? Because when I have guests who've, who've been on, you know, with multiple books and, and so on, I'm always thinking that in the yeah. back of my head. I'm like, what is, when I'm trying to, you know, um, trick people into the cult of Jeff, which book do I start with? And I'm wondering, if, <laughs> and I'm wondering, do you think this is the best book if people were, you know, uh, coming at your oeuvre cold? Because uh, I think it's, it's really, um, one, it's a delight to read, but it's, uh, it, it's almost like it can take people from a standing start to like, oh, holy shit, this is something. Well, it's certainly my shortest book, isn't it? Well, so, that also helps if you're so if, maybe, you're if you're trying to trick someone yeah, busy. <laughs> it, yeah, may I? Maybe it is. I mean, people have said that. I mean, they they have said that this is the book they'll hand people to try to get people to read the other books. And I didn't, I didn't write it that way, Gordon. That's why I'm hesitating a bit, but you know, the author is never in control of his or her work. It, it really, the reception of a book is never quite what the author had in mind. So I don't know if it matters what I think. Yeah. Good point. Uh, it matters point. more what you, it, ma- it matters more what you think. Yeah. Uh, and I, I always have an agenda with this stuff. I'm looking for the, the, the shortest list of sort of explosive books I can give people, the, the, the least number of books I can give people to, uh, you know, to what, kick them along towards what, something like a flip. Of, one of my other readers, uh, Christine Skolnick, she, she always refers to authors of the impossible as her, the gateway drug. Oh, that's, that you stays know, on so, the list you for know, sure. That would be her, that, yeah, that would be her book. But, but maybe this maybe this is the better book. It's certainly the shortest, and I think in some ways it's the most accessible. Excellent. I is hope it, so. Um, the, it's interesting to hear the original DNA of where, where the book came from, because uh, there is, and I found this really fascinating, it's not just that... Uh, scientists and humanists struggle to talk to each other. Uh, one of the things you explore in great depth, and it's sort of really alarming when it's described this way, but how did it come to be that the humanities themselves abandoned the idea that there is any such thing as meaning? I mean, it's it's almost like, what are you all doing here? <laughs> well, yeah. And, you know, this is where it gets a bit too focused on the profession, but but the book really is aimed at other humanists and basically saying, hey, this is our fault. Um, we're, we're ignored for good re- reasons, and we sort of created the situation in which we're ignored. And the book is a, a kind of plea or a kind of begging to sort of think our way out of the hole we've dug for ourselves by, you know, not just suggesting, but arguing that there is no meaning, that actually there is no subjectivity, that there is no author, there is no self, on and on and on. Um, I mean, who, who, who really does want to hear that? Well, um, how, did, how did that come to be? I mean, you, I had my own kind of version of that, which looked approximately like it, but you had a kind of, you're in the trenches of it, it's your career, and sort of looking back on some of the, um, the missteps or, or the meta models that probably were absorbed that shouldn't have been, for instance, or at least not taken as the sole model. I think. So the answer in the flip, I, I, the answer I give in the flip is that all of those ideas actually work really well and make a tremendous amount of sense as long as we restrict ourselves to the social ego, to the Gordon or the Jeff or, or the Julie or the, the, the Anish or whoever it is. But they don't work at all or they, they begin to collapse when we look at other states of consciousness or other states of mind that human beings routinely inhabit. And so I, I think one of the things that happened in the humanities is that we began to privilege ordinary states of mind and we began to ignore or demean or take off the table extraordinary states of mind. And as a result, our reality got smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, until we almost blipped out of existence, which is kind of where we're still headed. Do you think, I mean, I've, I've been doing the show for a number of years now, and yes, that, that is, there's certainly a lot of inertia behind that trajectory, but are you quietly optimistic that actually uh, a sufficient number of people will 
who are who are humanists or, or in that field are actually going. Do you know what? As a matter of fact, <laughs> there probably is an interiority to to human experience and and that isn't range bound at a social ego level. Yeah. I so again, this book is very optimistic. I I'm I'm optimistic for a number of reasons. One is, you know, we can talk all we want about how we don't exist and there is no such thing as consciousness, but the simple truth is we do exist and there is consciousness and that's not going to go away simply because we've argued that it should. So I'm, I'm optimistic because I'm metaphysically optimistic. I, I think these things really do exist and really are important. I'm also optimistic because, you know, I work with young people and I work with young intellectuals training to be older intellectuals. And I know for a fact that the young people I work with simply don't buy the kinds of total deconstructionisms that my peers and my colleagues were trained in in the 70s and 80s. They've moved away from it. Um, and I'm also, I also think, though, Gordon, I'm not just an optimist. I do think the kinds of the kinds of political and intellectual nihilism that we see in our societies are partly a result of what we've done in the humanities. And I think it's time for us to sort of turn the ship around and attempt to construct things and not just to deconstruct things, to, to envision things and not just take things away. Um, and so I am hopeful, but I don't, I don't think I'm naive and I, I don't think it, it's going to be simple or soon no, that sure. the ship heads, heads back out. Yeah. Is it, I mean, we, you're talking about different generations, uh, and, and the meta philosophies that they would bring or, um, or even just ontologies that they would bring to this kind of work. And there is that, um, almost like protecting one's career by not stepping out of it. But is that enough uh, to explain? Here's the thing. Uh, I have this idea that you aren't sufficiently deep in a subject, any subject, until you end up in sort of like theology. So you can go from electrical engineering into theology if you get to the depth of what's going on. Because if you actually yeah. stop and think about electricity, and it's kind of the same with the, the humanities, right? So one of the things that yeah. if you, here's a good one, like why is, and it's a question, why is it so difficult to explain the imagination? Um, if, if you're trying to go beyond uh, social ego analysis of something like a text, well, you then you have to confront what the hell is the imagination, surely? Yeah. And is that part of it, do well, you think? I, do you I, think it's like, oh, I'm, I'm suddenly in, it's not even just my career anymore, I'm, I'm in, a, um, in a state of philosophical crisis because now I have to look at reality and, and the universe rather than Shakespeare. I think I think if you get deep enough into any field, you do end up in in what we just might call mystery, for lack of a better word. Um, I think that's true. I, I was laughing earlier because one of my favorite books of all time is called The Theology of Electricity. All right. <laughs> um, which, which if, if you haven't read it, you must read it. It's, it's this beautiful little book. But anyway, I, I do think that these topics take us down the rabbit hole if if we allow them. And I even think, and this is what I tried to say in the book as well, it's not that I reject postmodernism or deconstruction or any of these thinkers that, you know, were sort of lionized in the 80s and 90s, people like Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida and Nietzsche and people like that. Um, what what strikes me, though, about all of those thinkers is that if you look at them closely enough, you know, you scratch them and they begin to look like mystics or, 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 or magicians, you know. Um, I always point out to my Derridian friends that Derrida wrote a long article before he died called Telepathy. And he took it very, very seriously and thought it was essentially the way things really are. and. Um, 
you know, Foucault had a massive LSD revelation in the desert in California. And Nietzsche had all kinds of mystical experiences, and essentially his works are essentially forms of revelation. So I, I, don't, I don't even, I, I think if you go deep enough into any of this, you kind of, you, you end up flipping. Yeah. And you end up seeing, seeing that actually these individuals weren't what we were told. They, they, they were flipped. And, you know, William James, for example, is always my biggest example there. We all read William James in college or graduate school, and we all read the varieties of religious experience, but nobody ever told us that the guy spent his whole life sitting with mediums and going to seances and writing essays and reviews and psychical research. Nobody told us that. Why? Well, because, you know, they wanted, I don't know, we, we didn't want to flip, I guess. There's, there's and, a, and so there you go. Get at in the, yeah, is that the whole, that it, I'm trying to rescue intellectuals and scientists from their own banality and their own PR, which presents them, unfortunately, as sort of these isolated elites in ivory towers. And in fact, they're human beings too, with all the depth and, and nuance and complexity of anybody else. And like other human beings, they're constantly having these mystical experiences or these uncanny events or these anomalous experiences. And they know they're real. They 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 often just won't write about them in particular professional settings. They're they're trying to protect their own status or their own their own place in the field. But but they know they're real, and and that's what again what I'm calling the flip is this: what happens to a person or what happens to a society when sufficient numbers of people flip over from a purely meaningless materialistic worldview to one in which mind and in consciousness or fundamental. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I have a similar game I play with my postmodernist friends too, because I quite, I quite like them, particularly Foucault. But if you give postmodernism the postmodern treatment, um, you, this, it sort of emerges the shortcomings and the value of it. Like I often say that Derrida is a kind of ersatz animism because it's, yeah. it's, it's essentially relationality, and I'm 100% on board with that. It's just the problem is the foundational metaphysics of what he thought um, was in relation. And, uh, and that is very kind of post-war French, right? And so you go, well, I can put that in the, in the context of what happened to Europe after the war and its suspicion of transcendentalism and so on. But nevertheless, they all ended up mystics with just like a shitty underlying metaphysics. <laughs> that's that's a good way to put it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I I'm with you, Gordon. No, Maybe sorry. that's why we talk. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, <laughs> uh, well. Let's let's try and let you know shoot for a better underlying metaphysics. Then, uh, what uh, is the imagination then, or what is a what is a better way of beginning to think with or about the imagination? Well. You know, I forget what we've talked about on previous shows, but, you know, I, I, the story I always tell here is I once invited a bunch of really prominent intellectuals to a conference on the imagination, and I asked them two questions. Please tell us the most extraordinary or bizarre thing that ever happened to you, and then please give us a theory of the imagination that would make that possible. And every single one of them came and had some crazy, crazy story that was just, you know, draw dropping or jaw dropping. And none of them had a theory of the imagination. So nobody could, nobody could explain it with anything. Um, and so I've struggled with this question. I struggle with it again in this book. Uh, ultimately, uh, I can't, what I come to a conclusion in this book is that the imagination is, is the question of what is imagination is the same question as what is consciousness. You, you can't answer it because to answer it means you have to explain it in terms of something other than itself, right? Yeah. If, if I ask you what a chocolate chip cookie is, 
you can say, well, it's dough and sugar and chocolate. You have to reduce it to something that it's not. And consciousness, for all sorts of reasons, appears to be entirely sui generis. It's its own thing. It cannot be reduced to or explained by anything other than itself. And I, I suspect the imagination is somehow a function or expression of, of consciousness. And therefore, we can't reduce or explain it to anything else as well. Now, but that doesn't say anything about the content of the imagination. Of course, what we imagine and what we see in a vision or what we see in a near-death experience, of course, all of that, we can talk about where it comes from, you know, what historical sources, what religious traditions. We can do that to the cows come home. But none of that answers the question, well, what's projecting all of that? You know, I can, I can, you can have Elizabeth Crone on the show and she can tell you all about her near death experience and what she saw on the other side. But you will never get to the question or to the answer of who or what was projecting all of that. And how was what she saw related to every other near-death experience whose content was different than hers, and yet the experience somehow, they somehow resonate with one another because they appear to be movies, essentially, projected by the same projector. So we, we can never seem to get to the projector at the back of the theater, and we keep getting lost in the story on the screen, and it's because we we lack this theory of, of what is doing this imagining or what's doing this projecting. And maybe there is no difference between the projector and what's on the screen. Maybe that's why we have such a hard time with the imagination is that consciousness is the imagination, which is consciousness, which is the imagination. I know that sounds like a mumble jumbo, but I think that's kind of where you go when you start to struggle with these questions. You end up in paradox. Yeah, you do. Um, I I swing through the fences and say it's identical to the spirit world, which is a, another way of saying it. Because it's funny when you have the discussions, you, it's you almost have to have three preceding discussions. Which is okay. Well, have you? tumbled down from the sort of Cartesian head trauma where we have to kind of go, well, yeah. Um, before we get to what is the imagination, we need to talk about what isn't. Like, it's a, it's a philosophy of mind challenge uh, where you go, okay, well, where where are we before we have this conversation? Do you, do you use, oh, that's just my imagination? Do you actually emphasize the just? Because if so, get out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you're not going to, you're not going to have a sufficient, um, engagement with this idea and uh, and if you keep saying things are just one's imagination but the other side of it because it's not just the the fact that you can't in that very yogic sense describe it without you know recourse to itself it's um the other thing that's fascinating about the imagination of course is when it does um, align or match to experiences in the waking world. And this comes from that sort of non-ordinary or extraordinary experiences. And, yeah. and one of the things I like yeah. about this book is like, oh, it's a question now. What happens if we try to build a philosophy of mind solely on, you know, ordinary states of awareness? Well, th- what happens is you get materialism or you get different forms of mechanism or reductionism. And again, this this is the problem. If you think about the imagination through only ordinary states of the imagination, like you know, me trying to you know, create a story off the top of my head just sitting here, of course it's going to be banal and it's going to be mechanical and you're going to say things like nothing in the imagination appears which hasn't been first sensed by the person in the environment. I mean, you're going to say things like that. But once you start looking at imaginal products like, you know, precognitive dreams, then you have to struggle with the fact that someone's dreaming or imagining something that in fact will take place the next day. And so there's that empirical kind of hook or, or link that you have to struggle with. It. And that just sort of blows all the circuits of what, what imagining is. So I think that's the challenge is how can we build a model of mind and of the human person that can take both of those into account? 
You know, we I think we don't we don't want just a model of the human that only explains or makes sense of the extraordinary and leaves our ordinary selves out of the picture. But we also don't want a model of who we are that only takes in our ordinary selves and leaves out our 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 super selves. I think we need we need both. Yeah, absolutely, and and probably my favorite part I think of the that's book. The cha- that's a that's the challenge. No, for sure, and and I would say probably my course. yeah, I would say my favorite part of the book is is you you kind of table that and then go through. Well, here are some models, right? Here are some here are some ways that yeah. allow us to to think with it. And I really enjoyed that. I have something similar in one of my books. But uh, here's a term I loved, and, and we'll get a definition of it. What's promissory materialism? Well, well, this is simply well, this is the position a lot of us have heard. Um, it's essentially, it's the idea that if we can't describe or explain something with a materialistic or mechanistic model, now we someday will. Um, and so you hear this a lot in philosophy of mind that, okay, I can't explain mind through neurons and synapses, but neuroscience will advance and will learn more and more about the architecture of the brain and we'll eventually be able to explain how mind emerges from or is an epiphenomenon of you know brain processes it's a kind of iou <laughs> uh you know i can't do it now but iou i promise i'll do it in the future and I want everyone listening to remember that term and understand what that is, because it's not just, it's, it's someone clinging to a belief system. It's also anti-science, because you can turn around and ask the next question, when in the history of science has that in fact been the case? It doesn't work like that. It, right. it, it uh, you know, a, a provisional model hits data that uh, the model can't account for, and the model changes or updates. You don't get it to, you're, you're dealing with no. terrible religious thinking at, at that point, and every needs right. Everyone needs to learn promissory materialism and throw it in the faces of people. <laughs> the other, the other one, you know, I, my, the heroes of this book in some ways are the historians of science who come up with things like promissory materialism. But another thing they came up with, which I just love, is presentism. I don't know if you caught that one. But oh yes, presentism is presentism is the idea in the history of science that that the science of the present it will constitutes a full explanation of all of reality, which of course is utter and complete nonsense in every single present there has been in the last 200 years since the birth of science. So what the historians of science point out is it's just naive to think that what science is saying now is what science will be saying in a century, much less two or three centuries. Uh, it's naive to assume presentism. Presentism is always wrong. Yeah. Dr. Sheldrake likes to point out that there are, in the late 19th century, um, examples of, you know, kids going off to college who are sort of dissuaded by their parents from doing science because it's like, it's pretty much all worked out. You know, <laughs> go, go and do something else at college because these physicists and chemists have kind of got it sorted. There's only a few more years left in the field and we'll know everything. And uh, I mean, I, it, that's just the perfect example of it. And he says, and I think this is true, and it, you know, it's one of those if I ruled the world things. I don't think you should be able to do a science degree without doing a history of science year to begin your degree. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, I don't think that that's almost never the case, actually. Yeah. At least in my my experience, but I don't think you should be able to offer an undergrad degree in a science that doesn't have a year of like history of science to begin with, and a full year. That I got that from Dr. Sheldon. It's like if you actually could put people in the flow of of how we've learned things over the last few centuries, they're in a much better state to to, to build on it and explore afterwards, rather than having the that yeah. kind of after the fact. Oh, it turns out the stuff I learned is quite range bound. Yeah, and the history of science, of course, inevitably makes science weird. Exactly. I mean, the actual history of science is very, is very, very strange and weird and wonderful. And the kind of simple science story of you know infinite uh, progress that never ends is just an ideology. It, it, it's just not true historically either. Um, so uh, the history of science ends up, I think, 
humanizing science and making it far more wonderful and, and strange. Um, and, you know, so Gordon, to, to, I, just having a thought here, to take us back to the book, I mean, the other thing to say about the book for, for your listeners is, you know, I, I always write about, for lack of a better word, mis- mystics, but I, there are no mystics in this book who are not scientists or medical professionals. And the reason I did that is I'm very aware that for modern audiences, like my students here at the university, for example, my undergrads, mostly studying in the STEM field, if you tell them a strange story of a person who's not a scientist, their first assumption is always, oh, well, they told that story because they don't know their science or they're, they're, they're not sufficiently educated. So what I did in this book is I pretty much only told stories that happened to scientists or, or engineers or medical professionals to take away that defense mechanism. Um, because I wanted to show the reader that, no, actually, these things happen to scientists and engineers as often as they happen to anybody else. And it's, it has absolutely nothing to do with your level of education or what, what you think you know. It has to do with who we are. Um, and you can't escape this just because, you know, you're a physicist or an MD. And uh, it's, it, I mean, it's a really good tactic. But beyond that, it's almost like, and in addition, if you're ready to feel even weirder about this, um, each of the sort of turning points in science is associated with one of these extraordinary, an interest in the extraordinary or an extraordinary event, because you've kind of got Madame Curie or Francis Bacon or, or so on, and they're all kind of, uh, it turns out, they these guys are talking to spirits or something. Yeah, Isaac Newton. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, Carrie Mullis. I mean, the, the book is filled of, with, yeah, it's not just that scientists have strange experiences, it's that the history of science is often driven or inspired by these strange experiences. Um, you know, the, the, the one case in the book that's so obvious there is Hans Berger, who, who basically helped create what we now think of as, you know, brainwave, the brainwave. Um, machines and he began that work uh he was actually in the military and he had a fall he fell in front of a a speeding cannon carriage horse-driven cannon carriage and was almost killed in this accident and at that very moment his sister who was many 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 kilometers away in another town instantly knew that hans was in profound mortal danger and somehow sent a messenger. I don't remember what the mechanism was, but she sent a message to Hans inquiring about his safety. Um, and he, re- he recognized very quickly that she had had this sense of concern or worry at the exact same time that he had fallen in front of this speeding cannon. Um, and so he, he thought, Hans Berger thought that there must be some kind of physical mechanism that connected his sister's brain and his brain and that they were somehow communicating physically. So he went looking for brain waves, you know, that could communicate between brain brains. And of course he didn't find them, but in the process he created a technology that, you know, eventually led to all kinds of other um, neurotechnologies. Um, so that's kind of how the science works. It works like that. It doesn't work by just sitting in a chair thinking things up. There's, um, I, I love this kind of stuff. It's, I, I did a similar thing with, you know, what I perceive to be the kind of 150 year preamble to the space program in, in my first book. There's something that happens as we particularly, some weird combination of having a ridiculous meta, um, metaphysics, which would be materialism, and the 19th century d- developments of technology that have some sort of ecosystemic interaction with 
the imaginal or the spirit world or what have you that presents in, in a bunch of surprising ways development of the space program and progressivism and science and so on over the last 150 years. And it just gives me the sense that we've always been in that ecosystemic interaction. It's just we have more um, precise and, and obvious technologies over the last couple of centuries that are, that kind of escalates that. But this is something that I think... I don't know. What, what do you think to that? That's a way of turning it into a question, I suppose. Well, can you can you say more, Gordon? Because I'm not I'm not certain the argument you're making there. The argument I'm making is coming back to a uh, an improved understanding of the imagination or the imaginal, and it's potentially having inhabitants that aren't humans, you know, aren't physical organisms or aren't stuff that is an epiphenomena of of human behavior. And there's just something about these weird experiences that happen to physical humans who then go on to do things like, you know, develop the notion of brainwaves or a space program or, or whatever that kind of makes you think, well, who are we talking to in there if it's in there? And I wonder if that's the natural state of mankind over the entire time we've been on the planet. And once we introduce there's almost like a runaway climate change effect of getting more technology that allows like even stranger things to happen when we have that interaction with the imaginal. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I, I always think I'm not certain. I still understand what you're saying. It, it might be beyond me, but one of the things I often think about is, is that, you know, in the history of religions, the, agriculture or writing or any kind of new technology, it always came from the gods. The, go the gods inspired it or the gods told us how to do it. And today, you know, we don't talk like that. And yet people do get ideas and do get inspiration from these, these strange experiences. So I'm not I'm that's sure sort of where I'm going. Different. Um, that's sort of where I'm going. Is yeah. trying to situate, um, I, and I call it technological complexity rather than um, technological development or improvement, because I don't necessarily think that's the case. Especially if we blow ourselves up, right? Turns out it was a mistake, right? Um, and I and, and that's kind right. of that. It's almost as if that interaction between whatever's in there, God, spirits, demons, and and the things we do within the waking world may not have a morality that we would um, recognize. And it kind of gets it into that eerie alien thing and, and a bit more animist and a bit less um, revealed religionist, I, I suppose, because it's, uh, we yeah. don't, if we don't know, if we don't have a sufficient model to go, okay, well, this might be in play. Like some inspirations may come from things that aren't humans, even if they land in my quote unquote head. And, and I've, I'm very interested in looking at the kind of like flow of technological complexity over time with this idea. And what happens when we get two things going at once, which is a good or serviceable model of the imagination and our available technology? It's, um, you know, what Donna Haraway said to Diana Welsh Pasuka is like, well, think about the implications of how many screens we have now, which is a technology, and, and what we display on them and, and how that interacts in our head. I mean, is something building a spaceport? Who knows? Yeah. The thing, the question that I've been struggling with, which I think is related to your thought experiment there, is it sort of goes like this. Is science making us better mystics. Mm. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, so I just, I just read Flatland for the first time with a class, and I was just frankly blown away by it. If you, if you have not read Flatland, you must. It's a little book in 1884, and it's, it's just absolutely brilliant. And it's basically about what we would call an abduction, um, there's this character named A Square who lives in Flatland, this two dimensional world, and this sphere literally comes down from above. And of course, there's no above in Flatland. And it enters this two dimensional space and it abducts the square and pulls him into Spaceland and shows him this world of three dimensions. And then he, of course, has to go back to Flatland and try to explain to his his flat peers what above is and of course you can't do it and but so where i'm going with this is so that little book along with the mathematics that was developing at the time is what 
gave us this language of hyperdimensionality and of four dimensions and five and six and so on. And so the question I have is when they, like say a Morrison or, or somebody, when they have a, a mystical experience and they talk about being in a fifth dimension or a four dimensional space, are they having that experience because of the mathematics and the physics we've been doing for 200 years and we can now more accurately describe what we've always been entering when we leave this plane? So, or is hyperdimensionality just another social construction that we're picking up out of the cultural surround and people are recreating in their you know, near-death experiences or their psychedelic trips or whatever it is. Um, because if it's the former, it means that the science is making us better mystics. We're getting closer and closer to what is really real. But if it's the latter, it just means it's another, it's another projection that the projector at the back of the theater is throwing up on the screen. Um, you see what I mean? Oh, 100%. Yeah, does that... Uh hundred percent. And and you mentioned NDEs. I think that's a really good example. We have a plethora of NDEs when we started putting, you know, crash carts and ambulances so that the, the most common cause of death in the sort of mid to late 20th century had a way of um, being treated in an emergency or triage situation. So, you know, before the 60s, people would die of a heart attack. And and now you, you put crash carts in, in ambulances and you can bring people back and, and we have this explosion of you'll never guess where I've been. And that's that's either science or technology surely making us better mystics just in terms of um, generating useful data. Coming. With, yeah. Right, coming back. But like, like, so when someone says, you know, when Richard Maurice Bucca says, you know, I became one and it's evolving towards this condition of immortality and absolute love. Okay, you know, that's 1900 when he writes that or so, or publishes it. So is he, it, has, has Darwin made us, made him a better mystic? Or has he just picked up on a little Darwin and used him for his own spiritual ends? I mean, you know, before Darwin, of course, there would have been all kinds of models of what we might call progress or development through some reincarnation model or some other model, but nobody would have spoke of evolution or an evolving universe. But after Darwin, of course, we all do, and people now claim to have mystical experiences around that. So again, is evolutionary biology making us better mystics, or are we just picking up on yet another language to have an experience in? I, I think it's better. Me, you go, that's sorry. the deeper question of, of the flip, too, by the way. I'm sorry. That's the deeper question of the flip. Because I think, I think the, the most powerful and the most significant influencer of the religious imagination today, hands down, are the sciences. I, Absolutely. I think the sciences are creating new mysticisms. Um, Take the NDE literature, take the psychedelic literature, take the quantum mystical literature. All of these literatures rely directly on evolutionary biology, on molecular uh, neurobiology, uh, on quantum physics. You know, they, none, of the, none of those literatures would have been possible 100 years ago. So there's something about the sciences that are actually generating new mystical practices and new new mystical worldviews, whether they want to or not. That's not the question. Of course, a lot of times they don't want to do that, but they're doing it anyway, you know. Well, that um, that's an interesting tension. So I, 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 like, that's an interesting yeah. tension in the sense of what what's your current preferred 
explanation is the wrong word. What's your current preferred way of framing that in a, in a longer historical timeline? Because I have, you know, last time I had Gary Luckman on, we sort of went down a master and his emissary angle of like, did we take this three century departure into um, this sort of, you know, Whiteheadian philosophical provincialism in order to get these things and, and come back? Are there reinforcements? Um, it, it, as you say, like science kind of doesn't want to, but there is something happening in the imaginal that is, is kind of picking up these ideas that we we use to validate oh, truth yeah. in the world and and so are there cosmic oh, yeah. reinforcements is that what's going on yeah i don't know i mean this is this is why i say i struggle with this i i i just don't know but really important is happening yeah i agree well this you know sliding it back into um previous uh books this would happen in a, a in a dominant of wider inclusions. This is what a haunted science looks like. This is the epistemology we need for the kind of next 40 and dominant, surely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good old, good old sport. Exactly. Um, or is it just because science is in fact, you know, it, it's essentially founded by wizards. So have, you know, you do magic for 300 years, <laughs> surely you get magical results. <laughs> Well, this is, you know, this is one of my complaints in the book about the humanities. Is, is the complaint goes like this. Why, why did a scientist get all the weird, wacky stuff? You know, why, I mean, shit, they can talk about anything now. They can talk about ghost particles and multiverses and entangled particles and, you know, anything they want. And it's cool. And people in the humanities, we we can't talk about any of that because it's all considered new age woo woo if we say it. So I just, I just think there's like this horrific kind of lack of, of symmetry there that we, I mean, I think it's great. The scientists go there. I'm all for that, but I think we should go there too. Um, because it's just, it's a better, for one thing, it's just a more interesting world to live in than cognitive modules and deconstruction. Uh, well, which and, I find really depressing. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think you do a, an amazing job, particularly towards the end of the book, of going like, well, look, if there, if we get the underlying model, not even right is the wrong word. If we improve our underlying metaphysics that allows it, and as you say, it doesn't change science, the actual practice of science, or indeed the humanities um, by doing so. It just it kind of. Um, breathe some vitalism back in them. But if they're heading in this direction, if if the humanities heads in that direction and we now have the opportunity of having a better dialogue between that the sort of interior and exterior of what must be like reality with a capital R rather than having them kind of broken. Right. I mean, I, I understand that a lot of your listeners might not their lives might not depend on the fate of the humanities, which seems like a pretty uh, literally academic, arcane topic. But if, if we think about the humanities broader in terms of, you know, questions about soul or questions about human, the human future, you know, then I think the question I'm trying to, to address is this, that where we are at today uh, at least in the kind of the conventional sciences, is that consciousness is essentially an illusion. It's essentially not real. There's certainly nothing like a soul. There's certainly nothing about the universe that is meaningful or going anywhere. Okay, so that's our metaphysics. Whether we agree to that individually or not, I think that's kind of the public metaphysics of the Western world. And if you understand that that's the metaphysics, then by necessity, these questions that humanists are trying to ask, like what, what, is, what is mind and what is consciousness, don't matter. They're silly. They literally don't matter because they're not real. We're, talk we're literally talking about nothing. So, of course, no one listens. Of course, we don't matter. But if we can flip this, you know, either individually or as a culture, and we come to the conclusion that actually consciousness is not just an epiphenomenon of brain processes, it's actually fundamental. It, it, 
probably even cosmic. It's probably woven in to the very nature of space and time and the entire universe. If we come to that conclusion, then suddenly the humanities or these questions of the soul and meaning and, and, and human destiny are all fundamental as well. They all immediately become real. Um, and so I think that's really what the flip is about is what do you consider to be real? Because if you consider only matter to be real, then none of these questions that Gordon or Jeff are talking about matter at all. There's just, they're meaningless verbal play. But if you consider consciousness or mind to be as fundamental as the material dimension, then these questions are fundamental and cosmic as well. So it all depends on what our, our metaphysic is and whether we... And that's that's essentially what the book book tries to do. Oh, it, it does a um, a great job of it. And, he, and I noticed you landed on, uh, and I'll turn this into a question too, something that Terence McKenna did as well when you were looking for, and it's just, it's it coded in the language, right? As you were just saying that, even the words does not matter encodes the idea that <laughs> it's only matter, like no matter, does not matter. You go, hang on, <laughs> how do we let you get away right. with that, right? Uh, but a really right. good example, I think, that is, and useful to kind of um, place on both sides of the table if you're talking about it from a cosmic academic department sense. Um, Terence once said, why does mathematics describe reality? That's a deeper question than most. most. And uh, and you explore like, well, hang on a minute, guys. Um, both sides, especially the scientists in this case, what, what even are numbers? Like, your materialism works on something that is mind. Uh, I mean, do you want to talk about the, do you want to answer Terence's question? Like, why does mathematics describe reality and, and what that might imply? Right. So, I mean, this is something John Wheeler used to say. He used to ask the question, why, why, what do we do with the unreasonable effectiveness of, of mathematics and science? Why do we get it right so often? Why, how can the human mind come up with mathematical formulas that end up corresponding al almost perfectly to the physical universe. We can send you know, men to the moon and back basically on just formulas we made up in our head. Um, that shouldn't be unless the mind itself is somehow keyed into this deeper reality. And so I think what mathematics, which, which of course is the privileged symbol system of the sciences. I think where math, if you think long and hard enough about mathematics, you end up being some kind of Platonist, essentially, that, that mathematics uh, is the very structure of reality, and to the extent that human beings can access and intuit, it's really almost out of nowhere, they too must be um, part of this reality that that mathematics is speaking about. So there's a kind of mysticism built right into why math works, essentially. Absolutely. Um, which, of course, is, is is ancient. I mean, this is what the ancient Greeks really thought. I mean, Pythagoras was hardly just a mathematician. I mean, the guy was a, a shaman. He was a raging shaman. Um, Greek shaman. So, you know, that's, again, it goes back to how do we wear the science? How do we how do we get back to these questions um, that are that are essentially religious or philosophical? They're not just scientific. And and sitting with the idea of or the notion that there there has to be something that is a one or a two in the absence of one or two apples in the physical, or else you know it it wouldn't work, doesn't change the, you know, the use of mathematics in, in science and technology. It's, it's, a, it's the perfect example of the, the kind of discussions that the, the book calls for, which is like, I'm not telling you to be scared of mathematics because it's a ghost. I'm telling you, like, you're using something that is definitionally at least platonic, but it does imply that there is something that is a one or a five, like in reality, no, and not just when you have five apples in front of you or something. Right. I mean, to me, the mathematics is the ultimate symbolic system. You know, 
a symbol is not an arbitrary sign that means nothing. It's it's a sign that participates in a sign. And this is exactly how mathematics works. It's you know, the numbers somehow express and participate in physical reality that which they're symbolizing. They're they're pure symbols. And so I again this is sort of the hope of the book. This is the optimistic bent of the book is of course, scientists can be mystics because mathematics is pure mystical symbolism. It's as pure as it gets. Um, so again, it's just, that's another example of the flip. You just you take something that looks banal or looks ordinary, and you just flip it, and you look at it from the inside out instead of from the outside in, and then suddenly it looks entirely differently, even though really nothing has changed. You've just your perspective has changed. Going through the models, right, um, do you have a, if you, again, rule the world, um, do you have a preferred replacement? Because we kind of go through, in the book, panpsychism and, and idealism, and that's and, the, and a, a really fascinating, like, iteration of monism that, that, you know, the likes of Jung and whatever used. Do you have a preferred one, even if it not necessarily describes reality best, but would be a better kind of, like, baseline metaphysics for this interdepartmental, cosmic interdepartmental interactivity? <laughs> so, I've hung out for years now with lots of quantum physicists and lots of philosophers of mine, and I've listened to them bat around these different models. And I always find myself landing on what I call in the book dual aspect monism. And basically, what dual aspect monism says is that we, human beings, are essentially splitters, that reality as it is, is neither mental nor material, or if you want to say it's both mental and material. And when it emerges and creates this weird thing called a human being, we then split that reality into an interior mental world and an exterior material world. But in fact, those are the same world deep down. So dual aspect monism, it, it's monistic on an ontological level because everything is one thing, but it's dualistic on an epistemological level. And in, the, in other words, how we perceive or how we know the world. And the reason I like it so much is because it explains so elegantly paranormal phenomena. Because for me, paranormal phenomena always possess both an objective material event and an interior subjective state, and they always correspond in some eerie or uncanny way, but they're not causally connected. That's essentially what a paranormal experience is. And dual aspect monism predicts that perfectly. It just says, well, of course that's what you experience because the the world that's one has been split into this mental and this material domain, and it's it corresponding with one another because deep down it's the same. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's it's like the so one I, event. Yeah, I, I love it. I think it's brilliant. That, yeah, I and I just find it a very elegant system. It's it's too abstract for me at times. I, I don't know how to relate to it as a person, um, but I I do. I, it is where I put my money, but but I'm not. I don't rule the world, Gordon. And, no, I yet. don't. I would be first. I would be the first person to abandon it if someone <laughs> came along and offered me something better. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, it's like I think that's a really good way of, even if it's a thought experiment, and, and people can have their preferred cosmologies. It is, as you say, a really excellent way of unpacking "quote unquote" paranormal events because it's saying it is the one event, and it, it almost there's almost like a flatland angle to it, right? Which is um, it, it, like moving down, uh, moving down into another dimension is one of those split activities, right? So, but it's the one sphere. It, it's just you're kind of getting the experience. It's it's the one event that's uh, expressed in your interior and the exterior at at the same time because it's the one event, like kind of pushing in and being split, as you say. Right, right, and I like it too because what. It matches perfectly what pe what people say who have these experiences that these experiences are deeply meaningful. These paranormal events are not meaningless. They're not just random nonsense. 
they mean something. And what they mean is that we're connected, that we're, we're deeply, we're grounded in reality itself. And we feel isolated and we feel discontinuous with the rest of being. But in fact, in these moments, we can see this kind of uncanny sense that, oh, actually, we're, we're, we're literally planted in this, this one, this one world. We're not, we're not really discontinuous with the world. Uh, that is actually a very good uh, statement to, to wind up the conversation on, <laughs> to be quite frank. I think that was amazing. <laughs> uh, what else you got coming up, uh, uh, Dr. Jeff? I mean, I'll, I'll, of course, all the details of the books will be in the show notes, but if people want to know more or so on, this is the, this is the time to, to lay it on them. Well, if there's anybody uh, in Chicago listening, I'm going to be speaking at the Chicago Humanities Festival on April 27th about the flip. Oh, awesome. So you can come and, yeah, that's, that's the next thing, I guess. Nice um, one. Other, other than that, Gordon, I'm pretty tired <laughs> in terms of writing books. It might, might be a while. You know, you said that the first time you were on the show. You're like, ah, oh, another book. Um, <laughs> and it's been like three or four books okay. since then. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, maybe I should keep saying it. Then. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I mean, this one, this one is genuinely fantastic, and I, I'm, I'm torn as to whether Authors of the Impossible or The Flip is is my um, my Cult of Jeff book to give people. Maybe I'll just be generous and give them both. But uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a tour de force. It was a really really fun read, and uh, and congratulations once again. Thank you, Gordon. I really appreciate. It. I appreciate coming on every time. Always, always an illuminating time. I'm still sitting with the possibility that science is making us into better mystics. At the moment, I've got a jailbroken and slightly haunted understanding of what science does and does not show us has the potential to make us into better mystics. Not quite as catchy, I give you that, but that's where I'm at. For those of you who have read uh, some of Dr. Kripal's previous work, The Flip is a really fascinating elaboration on some of the, I guess, useful models you could see Jeff working through from The Supernatural, Changed in a Flash, and even parts of Secret Body. Uh, if you've not read any of Dr. Kripal's work before, then The Flip and Authors of the Impossible is the ultimate beginner's combo. So, so think seriously about that. We uh, briefly touched on, I guess, one of the parts of the book I found the most fascinating, which is Jeff's description of what he calls dual aspect monism. It's interesting because monism is often one of those, like, I don't know, trigger words for those who operate with a more embodied metaphysics. And having had a bit more time to process it, I actually enjoy the tension that comes from Dr. Kripal's use of the term, because it's certainly not deployed in that Plotinian supernal sense. It's much more, it's much more Jungian, it's much more underneath. Uh, and it would be good to have some of the premium members read the book so we can potentially kick the tires on its use as almost a transitional framework for moving toward, I guess, a full interiority model. So that's this week's podcast. Uh, check out the show notes for more details about the book and where to buy it. Subscribe in your favorite podcatcher. Get in touch with me at runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page. And find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.